The term game feel is almost like Metroidvania in that nobody really seems to like using the phrase, but we're sort of stuck with it. It's something of a catch-all phrase that's used when describing our enjoyment of a game, akin to saying that something is aesthetically pleasing. What do we mean when we say that a game feels good? Let's start with the obvious, the controls. What makes a game feel good to control? To examine this, we will need the help of a certain little plumber. It's me, Mario! Every major Mario release gets pretty much universal praise for its controls. They have essentially become the standard that all other games look up to. In this video, we're going to look at how Mario controls. I won't get into the nitty gritty detail and math involved, because frankly that's a little above my understanding, at least for now. Instead, we're going to cover four main pillars of movement in Mario, and how other games also tackle them. Just to be clear, I am not saying that these games are bad, just that they handle controls differently and therefore have a different game feel to Mario. Now, with that public service announcement out of the way, let's get started, appropriately, with acceleration. Looking at Mario, we can see that the acceleration time is short, though noticeable. What's more, in the most recent game, after a few seconds of sprinting, he bursts into even more speed, which encourages the player to maintain forward momentum. Comparing the acceleration to Sonic, we can see that while they take similar times to reach maximum speed, they handle acceleration differently. Mario has different tiers of speed, whereas Sonic is more gradual. Increasing the time between standing still and reaching a maximum speed can result in your game having a less responsive feel, giving it more of a floaty quality, especially when you apply these rules to jumping, though we'll come back to that later. Conversely, games like Castlevania have no acceleration at all, which results in the game having a more stiff quality. Constant speeds may seem preferable, at least in theory, as surely this means that there are less speed variables to deal with, which will result in more control. Though that simply isn't the case at all, as acceleration actually allows for much more precision than would otherwise be possible. To play an example of this, I highly recommend downloading Mark Bentarelli's playable example, which allows you to change the rate of acceleration. Try placing the character directly beside the blades of grass, and you'll find it much easier with acceleration than without it. After running for a few seconds, you may want to come to a stop or even change direction. This is where momentum comes in. This may not seem important, but the way in which momentum is handled not only affects the way your character controls and feels, but can also add a little personality and presence as well. With Mario, you can see him de-accelerate, come to a stop, shift his weight, then accelerate in the opposite direction. Any change in direction less than 90 degrees will result in him maintaining his current speed, but changes over 90 degrees, which may result in you moving the thumbstick over the centre of its slot, will cause him to stop and shift momentum. Compare this to a game like Grow Home, where Bud is much more unwieldy. Even the slightest change in direction can take a noticeable amount of time to correct. Meanwhile, in Castlevania, we can see that Simon has next to no momentum whatsoever, same as Jumpman in Donkey Kong. This, paired with a lack of acceleration, requires much more precise input from the player. Mario and even Sonic, while not without their share of difficult levels, both allow much more freedom and contrast while also giving the characters much more weight, presence and personality. While stopping and starting is important, it's the actual movement that we are dealing with for the most part. This is where friction comes in. Friction dictates how the player interacts with the ground. Mario, for example, has little to no friction going on and may as well be slightly floating above the ground as it doesn't seem to hinder him at all. This is in keeping with what we love about him, as he's so loose and carefree. Compare this to a game like Abe's Odyssey, which shares a lot of similarities with Mario in terms of acceleration and momentum. But Abe seems to have more friction than Mario, while Mario feels like a bar of soap slipping and sliding about levels. Abe feels like he's running in mud or against a strong wind. Another example would be a game like Bionic Commando, which has so much friction that it essentially encourages you to make the full use of your bionic arm in order to travel just a little bit faster. Speaking of flinging yourself in the air, We've looked at the x-axis, now let's look at the y. After all, what would Mario be without his ability to jump? Much like in real life, jumping causes a collision between two different forces, the upward momentum of the jump and the downward push of gravity. You can alter the size of the jump by holding onto the jump button and can even change direction in mid-air. But there are actually a couple of illusions at work that make Mario feel better and it actually involves taking input away from the player. To perform a small jump, you need to simply tap the jump button. 
though you'll notice that no matter how quickly you push the button, the jump arc is the exact same. Releasing the jump button doesn't result in Mario immediately losing his upward momentum, instead he continues to rise for a moment before gravity finally takes over. This allows Mario to maintain his jump arc, which is one of his most important, recognisable traits. Holding the button for longer results in him jumping higher, though similar rules apply. After a certain point, around about here, holding onto the jump button doesn't actually affect Mario in any way, but we still do it because it makes us feel in more control. We're so used to the arc and the little rise after letting go of the button that we convince ourselves that we can reach a little bit further, even on the way down, if we just hold on to that jump button. If the jump arc was more triangular, it would seem foolish to believe that holding onto the button makes us jump further. Such jumps are useful in games, such as in the Jedi Knight series, but only because the camera is directly behind the player, so it allows for more precise landings, though even this jump has a slight rise after letting go of the button. On the other hand, Castlevania has a very strict jump policy. You can't even change direction in midair, and there is definitely no illusion that you can jump further by holding onto the button, as he has the exact same jump arc each and every single time he jumps. Now, it may be easy to look at any of these games and say that one controls better than the other, but movement is only part of what makes a game fun to play. The next step would be to build a world around the movements. How do the controls react to the environment? You have to consider things like collision detection. Mario can hit some platforms but can jump through others. How does his friction change when running on different surfaces like sand or ice? And of course, there's ghost jumping. But we're starting to veer into the realm of level design, so we'll stop here for now. Besides, we're not quite done with game feel yet, as controls are only a part of the equation.